class and welcome to the other half of chapter 13. Um, if you remember chapter 13, we have five um, PowerPoints. So we have five parts. And um, in this second half of the lecture on chapter 13, we'll be going through parts C, D, and E. Um, but I'm going to kind of skip over part D. Uh, you'll still be responsible for part D, but T, part D takes you through a lot of um, the anatomy of the spinal uh, nervous system. So we'll continue on with uh, part C here, which kind of continues where we left off. If you remember, we've been talking about hearing, taste, and smell, and now we're, or, or a sight, taste, and smell, and now we're going to be talking about hearing. So the hearing apparatus that we have allows us to hear an, ex an extraordinary range of sound, and our equilibrium, our balance receptors, continually inform the nervous system of movement and position um, of our body. So here's uh, the structure of the ear and how we divide it into three main areas, the external, the middle, and the inner ear. And receptors for hearing and balance will respond to separate stimuli and are activated independently of each other. So you have, your, you have receptors for hearing in your ear and also the receptors for your um, the ability to balance. So here's a little bit of review about the structure of the ear. Um, I'm going to skip over this because it, go, it takes you through basic anatomical structure from the ear that you should um, know and remember uh, from anatomy class. So here is the structure of the ear. The middle ear um, is air filled. And there's a look at the three small ossicles that make up the middle ear, the malleus, incus, and stapes. And in the process of hearing, hearing um, sends vibrations of sound waves through the tympanic membrane. Um, through these three small ossicle bones, and the stapes will kind of um, vibrate against what we call the oval window that um, kind of sends these sound wave vibrations through the oval window and into the vestibular and cochlear apparatus. And within the vestibular and cochlear apparatus, as we'll see, um, is filled with fluid, and that's what the sound waves will move through. So here's the middle ear again. Um, the auditory tube connects the middle ear uh, to the nasopharynx to help equalize air pressure when you're um, in the mountains or up in an airplane. Here's more of the middle ear structures. Uh, otitis media, again, it's an itis word. This is a middle ear inflammation. And then we have some inner ear structures. Uh, the inner ear structures are also referred to as the labyrinth or a maze. And we have two main divisions of the inner ear, the bony labyrinth, which is the system of channels and cavities that worm through the bone. And it's divided into three regions, the vestibule, the semicircular canals, and the cochlea. And those are all filled with perilymph fluid, which is similar to um, cerebral spinous fluid. And then the membranous labyrinth is a series of membranous sacs and ducts uh, contained in the bony labyrinth that are filled with potassium-rich endolymph. So here's a look at the membranous labyrinth of the inner ear. The inner ear then has the vestibule, which is the central egg-shaped cavity. It contains the saccule and the utricle. The saccule is continuous with the cochlear duct, and the utricle is continuous with the semicircular canals. The semicircular canals are three canals oriented in three planes of space, anterior, lateral, and posterior. And then the ampulla is the enlarged area of the ducts of each canal that houses equilibrium receptors um, called the crista ampullaris um, that help to respond to any sort of rotational movement of the head. So here's a look at the membranous labyrinth and the inner ear. The cochlea then is the small spiral conical bony chamber. It's about the size of a split pea, so extremely small. Um, it extends from the vestibule and it coils around the bony pillar. It contains the cochlear duct, which houses uh, the spiral organ or the organ of corti, where your hearing receptors are located, and ends at a cochlear apex. The cochlear duct then is divided um, into three chambers, the scala vestibuli, the scala media, and the scala tympani. And I'll show you these chambers here. So here's um, a look at the cochlea, so it looks like a snail shell that's round, wound around each other. And if you can see here, the cochlear nerve comes in um, and its branches reach into kind of each kind of winding of this cochlea. And we're gonna take a, like a zoomed in look 
at a cross section of the cochlear duct if we were to unwind it. And that's what this picture is, the anatomy. Um, so you can see here kind of a little square cross section of an unwound uh, cochlea. And then we're looking at here, the scala vestibuli is the chamber on top, um, the cochlear duct in the middle, and then the scala tympani below. And within the cochlear duct, we see this spiral organ or the organ of corti, which is what we'll zoom in on because that contains uh, your hearing receptors. You'll also see kind of going into, in, into each spiral organ is a spiral ganglion that will eventually reach, reach out to the cochlear nerve to take any sort of um, stimuli from hearing up to the brain. Um, so here is the cochlea. We have a vestibular membrane, which is the roof of the cochlear duct that separates um, the scala media or the cochlear duct from the scala vestibuli. And then we have the cochlea itself. Um, we're gonna talk kind of about the basilar membrane because that is the membrane that supports the spiral organ. Um, the spiral organ contains cochlear hair cells, which are functionally arranged in one row of inner hair cells and three rows of outer hair cells. And the hair cells are sandwiched between the tectorial and the basilar membranes. And the cochlear branch of cranial nerve number eight will run from the spiral organ to the brain. So here's just a look at this basilar membrane. Um, and then we have these outer and inner hair cells that are embedded into what we call the tectorial membrane. And basically what happens with sound really simply is that these hair cells will bend. Um, and the bending of the hair cells, that stimuli in the hair cells will bend because waves are traveling uh, through the fluid of the cochlea, bending these hair cells. And when the hair cells bend, depending how they bend, um, that bending is taken up by fibers of the cochlear nerve. So here's a look at the anatomy of the cochlea and actually a photomicrograph of it, which is really neat to see. Um, it focuses on the hairs of the inner and outer hair cell. The hairs create um, like a wavy row and they have the appearance of yellow seaweed. And here's just a look, a summary of the internal ear, a good summary for maybe you guys to kind of review um, the bony labyrinth, what makes up the bony labyrinth, the membranous labyrinth, and then the function of each. So the physiology of hearing uh, that we'll go over briefly, you know, this chapter 13 is so vast that if we think about all the chapters that are included in, in this exam, you could probably expect maybe one or two questions out of 100 um, that actually are on the physiology of hearing. So I don't want you to get bogged down by the details, but just understanding um, the overall process of, of sound and hearing is important. So sound is dependent on an elastic medium, one that physically transmits vibrations, and it travels much slower than light. It's a pressure disturbance, meaning it can alternate between high and low pressure, and this will produce a vibrating object that's propagated by molecules of the medium, which is air. Sound waves are created when an object moves, so air molecules that are displaced by an object movement are pushed forward into an adjacent area, adding to air molecules already there, so this creates an area of high pressure. And as an object returns to its original position, the area it leaves now has fewer air molecules. So this creates an area of low pressure. And this is referred to as rarefaction. Sound waves are alternating, alternating areas or waves of compressions and rarefactions. And the object vibrating causes the waves to move outward in all directions as air all around it is compressed and rarefied and kinetic energy of an object is transferred to air molecules, which then transfer it to other air molecules, and the wave energy declines with time and distance. So the properties of sound, um, this is illustrated with an S-shaped curved or a sine wave. If you've taken any sort of trigonometry, remember sine, cosine. Um, so the compressions are shown as crests and rare fractions are troughs. So this is just look what, look, what sound waves look like as they travel through air. Uh, the frequency refers to the number of waves that pass any given point in a given amount of time. 
uh, a pure tone has repeating crests and troughs, and the wavelength is the distance between two consecutive crests. A shorter wavelength is equal to a higher frequency of sound, and wavelength is always consistent for a particular sound. So here's a little bit more about frequency. Um, the range for human hearing is between 20 to 20,000 hertz. Pitch is the perception of different frequencies, and quality is the characteristics of sounds, while tone is one frequency. So here's just a look at the frequency and amplitude of sound waves, um, looking at a higher frequency for a higher pitch and a lower frequency in blue, meaning a lower pitch. Amplitude is the height of the crests, so the amplitude is perceived as loudness. It's a subjective interpretation of sound intensity. Um, the normal range in decibels is zero to 120. Normal conversation is about 50 decibels and the threshold of pain is 120. Um, some hearing loss can occur with prolonged exposure above 90 and amplified rock music can be about 120 decibels or more. So please take care of your hearing or you'll be like my dad um, who's lost hearing in one ear um, from childhood activities, firecrackers, I don't know what happened. So high amplitude um, corresponds to a loud sound and low amplitude corresponds to a soft sound. So the transmission of sound to the inner ear, um, this is something I want you to understand maybe more than anything. Uh, the pathway of sound goes through the external acoustic, acoustic meatus, um, through the tympanic membrane, causing it to vibrate. And the higher the intensity, the more vibration. Your auditory ossicles then transfer the vibration of the eardrum to the oval window. The tympanic membrane is about 20 times larger than the oval window, so vibration transferred to the oval window is amplified about 20 times. Then the transmission of sound to the internal ear travels through the scala vestibuli, um, the heliotrema path, the basal or membrane tract. As you can see here, you can kind of follow those sound waves as they'll th travel through the middle ear, um, traveling through the cochlea. So this is showing you um, a cochlea unwound and how the sound waves will end here at the round window. And you can go through these slides and pause to see um, the kind of process of sound waves. Resonance is the movement of different areas of basal or membrane in response to a particular frequency. Basal or membrane changes along its length. Fibers near the oval window are short and stiff, which will resonate with high frequency waves and near the cochlear apex are longer and floppier, and these are lower frequency waves. So here's just a look at uncoiling the cochlea to see how it separates um, different frequencies of sound so that we can hear different pitches. And that shows you the example of the short stiff fibers versus the long floppy fibers. The excitation of the inner eels, ear, hair cells. So here's where we'll talk about um, the sound transduction, your basal or membrane moves with response to those sound waves, and that will deflect or cause the hairs of the inner hair cells to move. So they will um, have little microvilli that will bend at their base. The longest hair cells are connected to shortest hair cells via tip links. And when the tip links, when pulled upon open ion channels, they're connected to um, stereocilia will project into the potassium rich endolymph, endolymph with the longest hairs enmeshed in a gel like tectorial membrane. So, this just shows you again how these outer and inner hair cells have tiny little um, stereocilia cells that are connected or embedded in this tectorial membrane. The bending of the stereocilia um, cause potassium and calcium ion channels. Um, to open, this influx triggers um, an action potential in the afferent neurons of the cochlear nerve, and the bending of the stereocilia toward the shorter ones causes the tip links to relax, and then the ion channels close. So again, really simply put, the bending of these stereocilia, which are the tiny little pieces up on the hair cells, when they bend, that causes calcium and potassium channels to open, causes a depolarization of the cochlear nerve, and then they'll close when things go back to normal. Um, this shows the pivoting of the stereocilia hairs opening and closing 
mechanically gated ion channels in the hair cells. Um, outside of that, I won't ask you guys too much to know uh, versus the physiology of hearing. This is a great um, kind of impulse that takes you through the auditory pathway to the brain of how um, the, uh, the stimulus from the spiral ganglia connects to the cochlear nuclei and the medulla, then eventually into a tract to the thalamus, and then finally to the primary auditory cortex of the cerebrum. Some fibers will cross over, some do not. So both auditory cortices receive input uh, from both ears. Your auditory processing, so the brain has the ability to perceive pitch, detection loudness, localizing sound. Um, so which side of the brain or which ear is hearing the sound? Um, equilibrium is the response to various movements of the head that rely on input from the inner ear, eyes, and stretch receptors. So now we're going to talk a little bit about equilibrium, orientation, and balance. Um, and here's just another look at the middle and inner ear to see where we'll be for the structure. The maculae is the sensory receptor organs that monitor static equilibrium. Um, one is located in each saccule and one in each utricle. These will monitor the position of head in space and play a key role in the control of posture uh, that responds to linear acceleration forces, but not rotation. So here, um, the macula, I'm not going to ask you guys too many details about this, but you should know the macula, the vestibule, the utricle are all important in equilibrium and balance of the head. So when your head moves either horizontally, vertically, rotationally, um, you have different things in the inner ear uh, that helps to control the balance or to um, kind of tell that something is bending. So here's what happens to your head upright, tilted forward, tilted backward to the little tiny hair cells um, within the inner ear and how the nerve fiber is inhibited or excited. The crista ampullaris is imp important for the receptors for rotational acceleration, um, angular movements. And you can see that here. I won't ask you too many details here, but the same kind of uh, physiology applies. In this structure, you have hair cells or hair, hair bundles. And when the hair cells will bend, that gets taken up. Um, that those either open or close as channels, and that action potential gets taken up. Here's just a scanning electron micrograph of the crista ampullaris, activating the receptors of the crista ampullaris, bending the hair cells causes depolarization by opening channels, um, bending of hair cells in the opposite direction causes hyperpolarization, so thus your brain is always informed of how your head rotates, which is just really interesting to see. So here's a look at the tiny uh, crista ampullaris in the internal ear and how those hair cells will bend in response to kind of stationary motion, rotation motion, and then back to relaxation or stationary motion. And with that, I'm not going to ask you guys too many more um, things about uh, rotation and balance. You should just know the general area of the ear where that occurs. Um, motion sickness. Um, is when sensory inputs are mismatched. So equilibrium problems are usually unpleasant and can cause nausea, dizziness, a loss of balance. Nystagmus in the absence of rotational stimuli may also be present. And motion sickness can be caused when visual input differs from equilibrium input. So your brain gets conflicting information which causes motion sickness. So if you're riding in the back of the car, driving up windy roads, um, what your eyes are taking in, which is a whole bunch of information, it does not match what your head uh, is feeling because your head is moving all over the place. Um, warning signs are salivation, pallor, rapid deep breathing, profuse sweating, treatment with an anti-motion drug that depresses the vestibular input, such as meclizine or scopolamine. So it will just basically um, try to depress the vestibular input so your brain isn't getting overrided, overrode with too much input. Conduction de deafness is a blocked sound conduction to fluids of the internal ear. It's usually caused by earwax, perforated eardrum, um, and inflammation, otitis media, or otosclerosis of the ossicles. And then senso neural deafness is damage to the neural structures. 
and any point from the cochlear cells uh, to auditory cortical cells. And it's typically, typically from gradual hair cell loss. And you can read a little bit more about this stuffness. Um, uh, tinnitus is a ringing or buzzy sound, usually due to cochlear nerve degeneration, inflammation of the middle or internal ears, or sometimes even a side effect of aspirin. Um, Myogenir syndrome is a labyrinth disorder that affects the cochlea and the semicircular canals that could cause vertigo, nausea, vomiting. The treatment is an anti-motion sickness drug in mild cases or surgical removal of the labyrinth in severe cases as well. So that takes us to the end um, of part C. And I'm going to briefly take you through. So part D, you're still responsible for, but part D is a review of the anatomy of um, the peripheral nervous system. So you guys should understand a nerve, the coverings of the nerve, um, but part D really takes you through. It's kind of an anatomy part. So I'm gonna skip over that, but I could possibly ask you some general questions where you should understand um, you know, the anatomy of the nerve. The cranial nerves, um, I promise I won't get too detailed in my questions about the cranial nerves. If I asked you a question, it'll be something simple, like what does the olfactory nerve do? But let's just say, I hope you had a great anatomy teacher and hopefully you remember something because this part is all anatomy. It takes you through the cranial nerves. Um, it also takes you through, I just want to point out a little bit about the spinal nerves, understanding um, really this anatomy of the spinal nerves with the gray white matter, ventral dorsal root, dorsal root ganglia, and how they come together to form a spinal nerve. Um, I want you guys to review that. And then we are going to finish with part E, and then I promise we'll finally be done with chapter 13, because chapter 13 I know is a doozy. Um, this whole module is kind of um, very heavy because there's a lot of nervous system. So we're gonna finish now with part E. It's a shorter PowerPoint slide, um, a little bit about motor endings and motor activity. So the motor endings are when your peripheral nervous system elements activate effectors by releasing a neurotransmitter. And these elements will innervate all your skeletal muscles, your visceral muscle and glands. This, these will take place at the neuromuscular junction and the neurotransmitter acetylcholine will be released when the nerve impulse reaches the axon terminal. So the acetylcholine will diffuse across the synaptic cleft and attach to acetylcholine receptors on the sarcolemma of the muscle. Acetylcholine binding to the receptors and skeletal muscle um, will cause sodium and potassium to move across the membrane. This will depolarize the muscle cell and what we call end plate potential occurs, which will mean depolarization will spread to adjacent areas of the sarcolemma, um, which is just the plasma membrane of the muscle cell, which triggers opening of more sodium voltage gated channels. And this just results in an action potential, which leads to muscle contraction. And these are the events um, shown here at the neuromuscular junction that you should be familiar with. Autonomic motor endings and visceral effectors are simpler than somatic skeletal junctions. Branches form synapses in passing with effector cells via varicosities. Acetylcholine and norepinephrine act indirectly via second messengers and visceral motor responses are slower than somatic responses. So this is just to look at how smooth muscle is innervated. We have these varicosities, which are kind of these synaptic vesicles, um, little kind of out pockets from the nerves. Levels of motor control. The complex motor behavior depends on complex patterns of control, segmental level, projection level, and pre-command level. And I don't think I ask you guys questions about these, but it's just describing different levels of control of the nervous system. What I want you to focus a little bit of your studying on is reflexes. Um, reflex arcs enable quick responses um, in terms of protecting your body from harm. An inborn intrinsic reflex is a um, rapid, involuntary, predictable motor response to a stimuli to help you maintain posture, control your visceral activities. It can be modified by learning and conscious of effort. 
and then a learned or, acquire, or an acquired reflex results from practice or repetition like driving skills. These are the components of a reflex arc that you should know. There's five components. The receptor, it's the site of the stimulus action. The sensory neuron transmits the afferent impulses to your cent central nervous system, like your brain or spinal cord. Then you have an integration center, which could be either monosynaptic or polysynaptic region within the central nervous system. The motor neuron conducts efferent impulses from the integration center to the effector organ. And then the effector is the muscle fiber or gland cell that responds to efferent impulses by contracting or secreting. So reflexes are classified functionally as somatic reflexes, which will activate skeletal muscles, or autonomic or visceral reflexes, which activate visceral effectors, like smooth or cardiac muscle or glands. So these are the five components of a reflex arc that you should know. And you can see how the receptor travels through the sensory neuron into the back of the spinal cord, the, the, um, the dorsal root, and then out the ventral motor root out the front. Spinal reflexes occur without direct involvement of higher brain sensors, and the brain will still be advised of the spinal reflex activity and may have an effect on the reflex. Uh, a testing of the somatic reflexes is important clinically to assess the condition of the nervous system. If it's exaggerated, distorted, or absent, it may indicate degeneration or pathology of a specific nervous system region. And it's most commonly assessed um, reflexes are the stretch, flexor, flexor, and superficial reflexes. To smoothly coordinate skeletal muscle, nervous system must receive proprioceptor input regarding the length of the muscle, which is information from muscle spindles, and the amount of tension in the muscle, which is information sent from the tendon organs. The functional anatomy of muscle spindles Three to 10 modify skeletal muscle fibers that are enclosed to connect into a connective tissue capsule and regular effector fibers of muscle are referred to as an extrafusal muscle fiber. So these muscle spindles um, are just attached to sensory inputs to the central nervous system. So you have endings which are wrapped around a spindle muscle or small axons at the spindle, spindle ends to just um, assess the stretch of the muscle itself. And a muscle spindle and tendon organ is seen here. So this just shows the muscle spindle fibers within the muscle and then the motor effector organs attached to that. The muscle spindles will be stretched and excited in two ways. An external stretch is when an external force lengthens the entire muscle. And an internal stretch is when you have gamma motor neurons stimulating the spindle ends to contract, thereby stretching the spindle. And stretching always results in increased rate of impulses to the spinal cord. So this is just a look at how muscle stretch is detected showing the appearance of a muscle and the number of action potentials generated in an unstretched muscle versus a stretched muscle. And again, this is just showing how muscle spindles will be able to detect the stretch of that muscle. Contracting the muscle could reduce tension on the muscle spindle and sensitivity would be lost. So the situation is avoided by the muscle spindle which it also shortens by impulses from different motor neurons that fire when alpha motor fires. So this alpha and gamma coactivation maintains a tension and sensi sensitivity of a muscle spindle uh, during muscle contraction. So the stretch reflex, the brain sets the muscle's length via the stretch reflex. So for example, in your knee jerk reflex, um, when the doctor bangs on your patellar ligament, it's a stretch reflex that keeps your knees from buckling when you stand upright. And the stretch reflex also maintains your muscle tone in your large postural muscles and it adjusts it reflexively. And this causes your muscle contraction on the side of the spine in response to increased muscle length or stretch on the other side of the spine. So how does the stretch reflex work? 
Stretch will activate the muscle spindle. Sensory neurons will synapse directly with alpha motor neurons in the spinal cord. And then the alpha motor neurons will cause an extra fusal muscles of the stretched muscles to contract. Reciprocal inhibition also occurs where afferent fibers will synapse with interneurons that inhibit alpha motor neurons in antagonistic mu muscles. So for example, in the patellar reflex, when the doctor bangs on your patellar ligament right below the knee with a hammer, your stretched muscle, your quadriceps contracts um, to kind of, your quadriceps will kick your knee out and your antagonist muscles, your hamstrings will relax. All stretch reflexes are monosynaptic and ipsilateral means that motor activity is on the same side of the body where the stimulus occurred. And monosynaptic just means that there's one synapse that happened between the two. A positive reflex reaction provides two pieces of information to doctors. It pro proves that the sensory and motor connections between the muscle and the spinal cord are intact. And the strength of the response will indicate the degree of spinal cord excitability. Stretch reflexes can be hypoactive or absent if a peripheral nerve damage or a ventral horn injury has occurred, and reflexes are usually absent in people with chronic diabetes mellitus or neurosyphilis and during coma. Stretch reflexes can also be hyperactive if there's a lesion of the corticospinal tract, which will reduce some sort of inhibitory effect of the brain on the spinal cord. So here's just a look at the stretch reflex. Again, it's um, monosynaptic, meaning there's just one synapse between the sensory and motor neuron. Um, you can see here the five parts of the reflex arc, as well as it's ipsilateral, meaning the stretch reflex happens on the same side of the body. So if the doctor hammers your right knee uh, and your right leg kicks out, it means just that the neurons responsible for getting your leg to kick out all came from the same side of the body. So here's a look at the stretch reflex with the hammer hitting the patellar ligament. Adjusting muscle spindle sensitivity, um, they can be inhib inhibited or stimulated by the brain. And it's important as speed as dif and difficulty increase. So as a gymnast on a balance beam, for example. Uh, the tendon reflex involves a polysynaptic reflex, and this helps to prevent damage due to excessive stretch, and it's important for smooth onset and termination of muscle contraction. The tendon reflex produces muscle relaxation in response to tension, and contraction or passive stretch will activate a tendon reflex um, where afferent impulses are transmitted to the spinal cord, and information is transmitted simultaneously to the cerebellum and used to adjust. You have a flexor or withdrawal reflex is initiated if you step or touch something um, painful. So it's an initiated by a painful stimulus and it causes an automatic withdrawal of the threatened body part. It'll be ipsilateral, so on the same side of the body, but polysynaptic. So many synapses come into play. It's protective, important for survival. Uh, the brain can override it for an example. And an example of this is if knowing you need to get a finger stick for a blood test is coming. Uh, the brain can override it so you don't pull your arm away, which is kind of interesting because in any other point, um, you would have an automatic um, reflex to pull um, your hand away from a finger stick. And the crossed extensor reflex occurs with flexor reflexes in weight-bearing limbs to maintain balance. And this consists of an ipsilateral withdrawal reflex and contralateral extensor reflex. So for um, if your stimulated side is withdrawn, the contralateral side will be extended. So your crossed extensor reflex um, and the flexor withdrawal reflex go hand in hand. For an example, if you step barefoot on a piece of broken glass, this will cause your damaged leg to withdraw, which is what we just learned about, the withdrawal reflex. But what it also causes automatically to happen is your opposite leg to extend to support the shift in your weight. Because if you withdraw one leg, um, your other leg has to be ready automatically to take over that weight shift. 
Um, someone grabbing your arm, for example, causes that arm to flex and the opposite arm to extend to pull your body away. So just really interesting how your body works all together uh, to really protect itself. And this is showing the crossed extensor reflex um, as shown there. You have more superficial reflexes, um, the abdominal reflex, the plantar reflex. They're clinically important to signal problems in upper motor pathways. Um, you have the abdominal reflex. So you, you'll stroke the skin of the lateral abdominant above. You'll have, you should have a contraction. If it's absent, you might have a lesion in your cortical spinal tract. Your plantar reflex is you stimulus if you stroke the lateral aspect of the sole of your foot, you should have a downward flexion of your toes. If primary motor cortex or cortical spinal tract is damaged, plantar reflex will be replaced by an abnormal reflex called the Babinski sign, where the great toe will dorsiflect or kind of flex out to touch your nose and the smaller toes fan laterally. Um, this is really kind of interesting because infants less than a year old will inhibit the Babinski sign um, normally because their nervous systems are not completely myelinated. And although clinically relevant, physiological mechanism of the Babinski sign is not yet understood. And we're finally done with chapter 13. Thanks for listening, guys. I hope you're all doing well.